Good morning. My name is Brad Olson. I'm the head Jesus follower here, and you can already probably feel that things are a little bit different this morning. Thank you to our Brass Ensemble for being here and for helping add to the spirit of this day. The reason that we have palm branches and that things are a little bit different is because today is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week and a day that we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem to begin the week that in those days would have been the Passover festival. Now we remember it as Holy Week. Things are going to be a little bit different in this service. Basically, it's got three parts. The first part is a choral dramatic presentation of the story. The second part then will be the message. And the third part will be that we'll gather around the Lord's table and celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Now, you may be wondering, what are these palm branches? Hopefully, everybody got one. If you didn't, I hope that you'll take the opportunity to get one. And here's what I'm hoping we can do with these palm branches. During the opening hymn, as we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, that we can wave these. And then the second scene in the um, dramatic presentation has to do with the triumphal entry. If you are so led, if you want to leave, leave those on the aisle, then as they did in Jesus' day, they laid those as he walked by. This will be our opportunity to put them then in the aisle. If you want to take one with you as you leave, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, they'll be gathered up, and we will dry them out and use them as kindling for next year for our Ash Wednesday service. All right, three other quick notes that I wanted to make. One is you may notice that there are some tables and a little bit of extra commotion out in the gathering area. We are having a mission fair this morning. So these are some, there's some information about our mission partners out there. So if you want to just kind of look at what's there, that would be highly encouraged. The other is that since this is Holy Week, on Thursday of Holy Week, Jesus gathered with his disciples and celebrated his last supper. We're going to have a special service that will focus on a tenebrae service and focus on the cross on Thursday at 7 o'clock. And next Sunday, you know what that is? Easter. So that's two things. One is if you know anybody that doesn't have a place to worship, invite them to join us on Easter Sunday. And the other piece of that is for those of the, you that are here, you are the hosts. So when you come next week, look for people that are new or a little confused that maybe are going to spend their, are spending their first day in the church and um, try to help them find their way around if they've got questions. And mostly just don't let them walk out of here without saying hi to everybody in here. <laughs> All right, I think those are the words of introduction that we need. And so, to turn things over, I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer to do our call to worship. One eighteen. It's interactive as usual, so please join in. You'll see it on the screen and in your programs. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say. Let the house of Aaron say. Let those who fear the Lord say. Open for me the gates of righteousness. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. You are my God, and I will praise you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Right now, I'm going to ask all our Sunday school families who are joining in the processional to head back to the gathering area and get ready. And for everyone else, I'm going to ask you to stand. 
We're all going to join in when the music starts. Let's wave our palms. We will welcome and uh, welcome the Holy Spirit in, and um, let's just all pray together and worship together. seated. We are a people of prayer and there is a congregational prayer that is either up on the screen or printed in your bulletins. I'd like to invite you to join together with me in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day your son Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branch, pray, branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray, amen.
Rabbi, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Hmm. Children, please join me up here. Sit right here. Go ahead and sit down. Sit down. Sit down, buddy. Sit down. You can sit down right there. That works too? Perfect. I tell you the truth. Unless you humble yourselves and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. But if you humble yourself and become like one of these little ones, you will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And if you welcome one of these little ones in my name, you welcome me. But see that you do not look down on these little ones, for their angels in heaven always see my Father's face. So, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one wanders off, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills to go search for the one? And when he finds that one, I tell you the truth, he will be happier about the lost sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your heavenly Father does not want to lose any of these little ones. So let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Thank you, kids. Go back to your seats. Good job. In our first scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can still feel the joy of the day we triumphantly enter Jerusalem. The smell of fresh cut palms, heavy in the air. All things coinciding with the scriptures. Say to daughter Zion, look, it is your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. Oh, lift your heads, O oh gate, and be lifted up, you heavenly father. The Lord of glory comes. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed were all shouting, Hosanna, 
to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It didn't take long, though, for trouble to come. In fact, barely a day passed before Jesus was questioned about who he really is. But he turned the tables on them and asked them about John the baptizer and whether his authority came from heaven or from man. And when they couldn't answer, he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What could they say? is Henry, and our second scripture reading is Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, 
Love your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was so amazing watching it happen. It seemed everywhere Jesus went, the people were questioning him, accusing. And yet, despite it all, nothing seemed to get to him. And when Jesus said, all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments, what else could they say? He silenced the religious leaders once again. And before this had happened, Jesus asked us, disciples, who we thought he was. We said, some believe that you're John the Baptist, or Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Without hesitation, I blurted out, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed are you, Simon. Blessed are you, Simon, for you did not learn these things from flesh and blood, but from my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on that rock I will build my church, and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. I'd like to invite you to stand and join together in the singing. This is a really pretty hymn. Let's sing together, Ferris, Lord Jesus. Thank uh-huh.
As you know, my name is Chuck. <laughs> the, uh, the third reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 31 through 35. <clears throat> then Jesus told them, This very night you will fall, all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I will never leave. I never will. I, truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The night they arrested Jesus, I followed close behind, stood outside the chief priest's house where Jesus was being held. Soon, people started to recognize me as a follower of Jesus. My fear and panic began to grow. You were with Jesus of Galilee. No, I was not. I don't know the man. I had to stay nearby. I didn't even think as I denied him. I wanted to help him escape, as I knew I must. This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. I am certain that I was not. I don't know the man. Just then, a rooster crowed, and I remembered the words that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. He called me the rock, but now this rock is broken into a thousand weeping pieces.
Thank you, choir. There is a legend about the donkey that Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday on. And the legend goes like this, that on Monday, the donkey went back into town. The donkey expected to go in town and there to be all these palm branches and all this waving and all this cheering, but when he got into town, instead, there was just quiet. He couldn't understand what had happened. People were so excited to see him the day before. And so then he was talking to one of his donkey friends who explained to him. He said, without Christ, you're just an ordinary donkey. Without Christ, this is just an ordinary week. I have this concern that um, there's a tendency to want to jump from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. The problem with that is it skips over the cross. And so what I'd like to do for these next couple of moments is draw us a little bit closer to some of the other stuff that happened in that week and draw us a little bit closer to the cross. We've been spending Lent preparing for Easter by learning about the disciple Peter. He's the best known of all the disciples. He is the one to whom Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and of whom Jesus said, you are the rock, and on you I will build my church. Jesus and Peter had become very close friends. They'd come to know and to trust each other. Peter had become Jesus' right-hand person. So what I'd like to do for these next couple of moments is focus on Peter's greatest failure. All right, in just a minute, we're going to gather around the Lord's table and celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. That will take us back to Thursday of Holy Week when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, the Passover meal with the disciples. You probably know that during that meal, because we have shared it already in the service today, Jesus said, one of you will betray me. That's when Judas left the room. And then he said, all of you will deny me. And specifically to Peter, he said, and you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter said, no, I go, I die for you, Lord. But Jesus said, no, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. From there, Jesus went out. He wanted some time to gather his thoughts and to pray. And so he went to a garden called the Gethsemane where he prayed. That was when Judas arrived with the troops and had Jesus arrested. It would have been getting late into the evening, probably around midnight. And the Sanhedrin, which is a group of about 70 scribes, Pharisees, and chief priests, all gathered together to give him a mockery of a trial. Now, this was the holiest season of the year, and yet still this group of leaders gathered together, and it's midnight. Who gathers together for an important meeting at midnight? So you'd think that there would be at least somebody, because of the the insanity of what's going on, who would say, this just isn't right. Instead, they turned Jesus over to be tried, or to, the, um, to Herod, and he was taken to the palace. Now, apparently, there was something in Peter that said, I don't want to entirely leave Jesus, but he doesn't want to get too close either. And so Peter is in the courtyard outside of where Jesus is being tried. Now, you remember how this went. One of the servant girls said, I recognize you, don't I? You were with that Jesus guy. And you remember her, his response? He says, no, couldn't have been me. And then another servant girl, Jesus, or Peter moves a little bit further out into the um, patio area, and another servant girl recognizes him and says, hey, I think you are Jesus, or you are Peter who was hanging out with this Jesus guy. And again, Peter says, I don't even know the man. That graphic came up just at the right time. Did you notice that? I do not know the man. So here, do you see what's happening? This is not just a mistake. It's not just an absent-minded moment. This is becoming a pattern, a way of Peter answering the question. It's getting to be late into the night, early into the morning. The sun is just about ready to come up. One of the guards says, you've got an accent. You sound like you're from the Galilee area, like that guy that's, that's being held, that's being held in the, the prison area. And again, Peter says, no, that's not me. And that's when the rooster crowed. Do you think there are ways that we all deny Christ? Have you ever found yourself denying Christ? Are there ways that, um, well, Jesus said, whatever you do for one of the least of these, you also do for me. So are there ways that we deny Christ by not helping those who are in need? 
There's a book called Sacred Bulls that talks about some of the things that are obstacles to our being faithful. And can you guess what they say one of the obstacles to our being faithful is? Denial. We tend to think that if we deny that there's a problem, somehow the problem will just simply go away. Have you ever done that? Ignored the problem, hoping that maybe it'll just solve itself. About three weeks ago, the engine light on my car came on. Do you know what I'm doing? I'm trying to pretend that it's just not there. I even got a little piece of black tape and put it over it. I'm hoping that somehow miraculously the little engine light will just simply go off. What do you think was going through Peter's head? Do you think maybe he just wasn't thinking? Do you think maybe he was thinking, um, well, I want to be helpful, but there's a limit to how helpful I'm willing to be, and dying for Jesus just is beyond that limit. Do you think maybe he was afraid? Another of the theories I've heard proposed is maybe he knew that if something happened to Jesus, somebody was going to have to pick up the ball and keep it going. So maybe he was thinking about the future of the church and was thinking, I need to protect myself so that we'll, there will be somebody there to build the church on. What do you think Peter was thinking? All right, this is all getting really depressing, so let's focus on something a little bit more hopeful and a little more positive. How did Peter get through it? How did he get beyond it? He's going to get to the point of being forgiven and redeemed, but how does he do it? Let me point to a couple things that I think are indicators. Here's one of the things that I noticed. When the rooster crowed, it said, Peter remembered. Peter remembered. Would you say that with me? Peter remembered. When Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law, he came down from the mountain and he started sharing with the Israelites the law. And he started out by saying, remember the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Jesus is at the Last Supper, he's breaking bread and he's sharing the cup. One of the things he says is, do this in remembrance of me. There's a guy named Fred Allen whose name you may be familiar with. He used to say, I have a hard time remembering. I especially have a hard time remembering three things. Other people's names, other people's faces, and something else. <laughs> what do you do that helps you remember? I once did a funeral service for a lady named Emma Wilk. And Emma Wilk, as part of her life story, was a family friend of a guy named Eddie Rickenbach. Have you heard that name? But Rickenbacher. Rickenbacher, is that right? Rickenbacher. Is that name a name that's familiar to you? There's an Air Force base up around the Columbus area that's named after him. Actually, I think it's a, now an Ar Air Force Guard base, and actually most of the traffic in and out of there is um, DHL traffic now. But do you know the story of Eddie, Eddie Rickenbacker? The story is that um, he was a World War I fighter pilot. In the earlier service at Monroe, I said he flew F-17s, but I was corrected that apparently he didn't fly F-17s, so you can fact check me on that one. But I think this part of the story, this is the way that I read it anyway, was he was stationed mostly in the South Pacific, but he also threw mission, flew missions to Africa. And on one of those missions in October of 1943, he was shot down. Most of his crew survived, but they ended up stranded in the middle of the ocean in a life raft. He said, as he wrote about it later in life, he said, the greater threats to our survival actually weren't the weather and they weren't the waves and they weren't the sharks. The greatest threat to their survival was starvation. There wasn't anything to eat. Now, where did their saving grace come from? Apparently they had a chaplain on board, and one Sunday morning he said a prayer for deliverance, and then they sang a song, a, a psalm, and then he said he rested back on the edge of the boat, pulled the cap over his head to get the glare out of his eyes and to shield him from the sun, and just as he was dozing off, he felt something land on his cap. Now he knew that it was a seagull. And the other thing that he knew is as he looked at the faces of everybody else that was staring at him, nobody said a thing, but he knew exactly what everybody was thinking. You know what they were thinking? Dinner! I won't go into the gory details, but the rest, as they say, is, is history. They credit that seagull as having saved their lives because a couple of days later then they were rescued. Here's the cool part of the story, I think, though. 
Eddie Rickenbacker, after he had served his time in the service, he um, retired to Florida. He passed away in 1973, but supposedly every day of his life, he'd start the day by getting a pail of shrimp and wandering down to the dock at the ocean. You know what he did with those shrimp? He fed the gulls as a way of saying thank you for the sacrifice of that one gull and of remembering how the Lord had provided a way of deliverance for him. What do you do to remember? What helps you remember specifically the Lord? What helps you to remember the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross? Here's one of the things that helped Peter. Peter remembered. Here's another thing that I noticed that Peter did that I think helped him get through this time. He went out and, do you remember this phrase? He wept bitterly. Are you willing to say that with me? He wept bitterly. Or in other words, he recognized that there was a problem. He knew that he had a problem that has, had to be solved. He didn't try to deny it or pretend that it didn't exist. He admitted it to it and he let it break his heart. What are the things that break your heart? What do you think the things are that break God's heart? And here's the bigger question. Are you willing to let your heart be broken by the things that break God's heart? There's a guy, a priest by the name of um, Alfred Romeo. No, that's not right. Felix Romeo. Is that right? Was he a priest? The quote is the part that I'm trying to get to that's the good part. He said, some eyes can only see when they've been shed when they've shed tears some eyes can only see through eyes that have cried do you think that's true that sometimes the best way to see the way that God is calling us is to let our hearts be broken one of the commentaries that I read suggested that hearts are like beds as long as they're made you can't sleep in them you have to unmake them before you can sleep in them you think there's some truth in that, in that? That we have to let our hearts be unmade, unsettled, before God can work in our lives. There's an old story about two brothers who were caught stealing sheep. They were sheep thieves. And in those days and in that part of the world, the way that that was handled is the letters ST for sheep thief were branded on their forehead. One of the brothers was so embarrassed by the stigma that he now was living with that he couldn't take it. He couldn't live in the community that he was in anymore because he was embarrassed, he was made fun of, he was harassed, and all he could think of was the thing that he had done worst in his life. He died in early life, he moved to another community, but the thing just followed him and he, he ended up being miserable and harassed and died an early, early death. The other brother, though, decided, I got to try to fix this. He decided to make what restitution he could for having stolen the sheep and then to live his life every single day to try to prove that he was not at his heart a sh sheep thief. Say that three times fast, a sheep thief. <laughs> years and years later, some other people in the community, he became an upstanding member of the community. Some other people in the community were talking about him and were, were noticing that stamp on his forehead and were asking, what do you think ST stands for? And these two people that we're talking suggested, I think it stands, stands for saint. Do you think it's possible that if we let our hearts be broken by the things that break God's heart, we really can change the story of our lives? We can really change the way that we are seen and the way that God sees us. Are you willing to let your heart be broken by the things that break God's heart? What are the things you see going on around you? Are there people you know that are going through difficult times? Is there a way that you can be there for them? Do you know somebody that's lonely? Maybe you could be reaching out to them. Do you know that somebody that's struggling with what it really means to be loved? Do they may, maybe need to understand what Christ shows us in his journey towards the cross? Are you willing to let your heart be broken by the things that break God's? All right, one more thought. Here's another thing that I noticed, and that is that Jesus told Peter that he would go ahead of him to Galilee. Now, I know that's a lot of words, but will you say it with me? Jesus went ahead of him to Galilee. Now, why might that be important? And notice that he says this even before he is crucified. So he apparently knows what Peter is going to do, and already, do you see what he's doing? 
Jesus in his resurrected form is Jesus, and he's resurrected. So he could have gone anywhere. He could have done anything. Right? We know that he can walk through locked doors, and he can just kind of appear and disappear like magic. So here's my question. If you could go anywhere and you could do anything, where would you go? What would you do? I got some places that are coming to mind. I'd like to go back to Greece. I'd like to spend some time in Tuscany. I'd like to go to the south of France. Where does Jesus choose to go? A little fishing village in the middle of nowhere in the Middle East. Why would he want to go back to Galilee? What's in Galilee? Anyone want to try an answer to that question? What's in Galilee? Peter is. The disciples are. Or in other words, the most important thing to Jesus when Jesus can do anything is to provide a way back into a right relationship with him. Now, do you see the good news in that? Is there a place where you've failed the Lord? Is there a place where you've denied him or betrayed him? Do you see what Jesus is doing? He provides a way back, a path for us to find our way back into a right relationship with him. I think there's some good news in that, don't you? And so here's my challenge. My challenge, I guess, is knowing that the Lord goes before us. There's a person by the name of Barbara Taylor Brown who, in her commentary, she says, I know some sheep farmers, shepherds, and she says, here's one of the things I've learned from my friends who work with sheep, that you don't herd sheep the same way that you herd cows, for example. You know how you herd cows? From behind, right? You push them on, you get a whip or loud noises, you yell, you ride on a horse and get dogs and you, you try to push them forward. But do you know how you herd sheep? The shepherd is always out ahead, out in front. The shepherd leads the sheep and trusts that they are trusting enough that they will follow him. That's the kind of God that we worship, who's always out front, always leading the way, always showing us that there is a path back into a right relationship with him. So if we're struggling, the good news is that Christ provides a path, the way of the cross, for us to be back in a right relationship with him. And if you already know that, then you might take on this challenge. Think of somebody who's not in a right relationship with you and ask, is there a way that I might be able to provide a path for them to get back into a healthier relationship? While you're thinking about that, here's an example of somebody that I heard old story, I don't even know where I heard it anymore, about a, um, a, a couple who had a teenage daughter that was learning to drive. Now, the father of this couple had spent years restoring an old Mustang. This was his prized possession, beautiful old Mustang. But when it came time for prom season, can you guess which car she wanted to drive to prom? Now, he had to think about that one. Was he going to let his teenage daughter, who was just learning to drive, drive his prized, beautiful Mustang to prom or not. He finally reluctantly decided to hand over the keys, along with every rule that she was supposed to follow in the book. Now, the worst imaginable happened. She got in a fender bender. You know what happens when you get in a fender bender. The police arrive, and they ask for your insurance card. So she went over into the glove compartment box to pull out the insurance card, and there was a letter. I wish I was this smart along with the insurance card in the glove compartment box. Would you like to know what that letter said? It said, remember, dear, it's you I love, not the car. He had looked forward enough to know that there would be a point where she would make a mistake and provide a way back to reconcile and find forgiveness. That's the kind of God we worship. Peter found forgiveness by remembering, by remembering the Lord. He went out and he wept bitterly. And Mark says, be especially sure to tell Peter that I've gone ahead of him to Galilee. I'd like to take a moment and remember those times, and especially what happened on the Thursday of that week, and invite you to gather with me around the Lord's table as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. For the last several thousand years, it's begun with a greeting that goes something like this. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let's, let's give, it is right to give our thanks and praise. Now I'm supposed to say that let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Now I'll do the, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It's a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast, that renewed by your word and sacrament and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I remind you that on the night before Jesus gave himself up for us on the cross, he gathered together with his disciples and took bread. Probably flat, unleavened bread to remember the matzah that they'd uh, used during the Passover. Jesus took bread, he gave thanks to God, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. During that meal, we also know that he took a cup. Again, he gave thanks to God and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Will you join together with me in prayer? Let us pray. O holy and gracious God, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in the Nashville area in the wake of a horrible school shooting down there. We know what it's like to be afraid, and we pray for the families who have lost loved ones and for those who live in fear. Give your courageous and calming power of your Holy Spirit. We pray for also those whose lives have been lost in the um, military helicopters that crashed this week. We know that um, they have families also and that you never really know what the future is going to hold. And so we pray for those that, that live in the, that are grieving their loss. We pray for all of those who have been affected by tornadoes in the last couple of weeks, especially those in Mississippi and Arkansas who are literally picking up the pieces of their lives. We pray that you'll surround them with good people and give them to the courage and the insight to figure out what their next steps are. Holy God, we remember your son's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and we confess that we all too often have been a part of the crowd. When things go our way, when we, we believe our lives are good because we've worked hard, but when things don't go our way, we blame others for our troubles. God, help us to take responsibility not only for our own lives, but also for the lives of our neighbors. Forgive us when we have forgotten the commandments and failed to love our neighbors as ourselves, but instead have judged others, believing them not worthy of our help or our compassion. Forgive our faults and renew a sense of your love, justice, and mercy. Guide us in the way that, ways that we might live out your commandments more fully in our lives to be Christ's hands and feet in a suffering world. To that end, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on each of us who is gathered here this morning and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. We offer these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught the disciples once and who teaches us still to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
In the United Methodist Church, we practice an open table. Let's see if I can do that without catching myself on fire. Which means anybody is welcome to receive these signs of God's grace. They are not offered because of how good we are, but how good God is. There are some who have agreed to help in the serving of this meal. I'd like to invite you to join with me at this time. broken and shed for you. All right, the meal's ready, the table's prepared. You can have a couple of options. We've got three serving stations here. We've also got prepackaged, gluten-free, if you'd like to go this route. That'll be right here in the middle. The meal's ready, the table's prepared. I invite you to come as you will and receive these signs of God's grace. I remember it.
there anybody else who would like to receive these signs of God's grace that hasn't had an opportunity yet? We've tried to get the bread and the cup around. All right, if Jesus can use a donkey in the fulfillment of his purposes and of his kingdom, then certainly there is something that God can use that each of us has. And so as we stand and join together in singing our closing hymn, our ushers are also going to come forward and they're going to be passing the offering baskets among us. This is our chance to support the work of the Lord through the Loveland United Methodist Church. Thank you for your generous giving. I have favorite hymns, but this is probably the prettiest and most powerful of the hymns in the hymnal. Let's sing together, What Wondrous Love Is This? that is that we have a mission fair in the back. Please, if there's somebody around, standing around one of those tables, ask them what they do. I bet you'll uh, learn something in the course of this. These words are inspired from the 118th Psalm. The gates of righteousness are thrown open wide. Go with Christ's blessing. The path of salvation is made plain. Walk in the ways of truth and life. The cornerstone of our faith is sure. Our lives are built on the foundation of our God. Go in peace to serve the Lord. And the people of God all said, Amen. Amen.